That's a no-brainer. Come on. Who would pick a rifle over his spouse? Well, don't answer that unless you really understand the relationships. No, nope, my wife is shaking her head. It has been disproven by the research. Oh, this should be interesting. And we make all this fuss about, oh my gosh, do I need one of these or will this one do the job? <laughs> but gets pretty complicated and confusing and that's why I'm, I'm not going to be doing it here because that new cartridge that the military is uh, has adopted they have accepted it as a rifle cartridge that they are going to use I don't know I've got about a half dozen of them and I'm the one that was my favorite it uh, essentially had the same diameter of case without a belt as the current fat shorts have like the WSM and I went on and on with all sorts of personal stuff I apologize guys but I hope we all learned a little bit of something about something it sounds like it might be kind of cruel here let's see a critical review it's getting worse <laughs> How to handle 6.5 Creedmoor fanboys, where do you find a good single shot rifle, and what is it with these bells I'm ringing? We're going to find out all of that on this episode of Ron Spomer Outdoors Podcast. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining me. Say, we've got some great questions today from our patrons and others. We're going to dive right in, and then we're going to tell you all about these bells that I've been ringing lately. <laughs> First of all, a uh, patron, uh, Mark, and I have been writing back and forth and discussing cartridges and calibers and what we should build next and that sort of fun stuff. And Mark says, uh, for a while there, it seemed like the 284 Wildcats were getting really popular. It seems like they've kind of died out. I wrote back and said, yeah, such things come and go. While the bulk of shooters and hunters stick with factory cartridges. It has always struck me as odd that major ammo makers are so slow to accept and legitimize Wildcats. It took Remington some 40 years to bring out the 22 Varminter as the 22 250 in 1965, and then the 22 or the 25 Needner as the 25 06 in 1969, I believe. Now, why Winchester didn't release the uh, 284 Winchester as the 6.5 by 284 really surprised me. But at least Norma did. Alas, now that that long high BC bullets are all the rage, everyone is creating slight variations on the old cartridges to make the new, well, PRC types and similar. Mark writes back and says, well, the 284 and the 6 and 6.5 284 versions are much better than the Creedmoor. I've got to the point where I'm starting to hate anything that has Creedmoor in its name, especially when someone tells me they can kill an elk at 700 plus yards with their 6.5 Creedmoor. But yet, an old 3030 or a 35 Remington or 32 Special isn't capable of anything past 75 yards? Makes me so mad. I'm not 100% sure, but I think any of those others are better at 200 yards than the Creedmoor is at 700. <laughs> so I wrote back one more time. I said, hey, Mark, I feel your pain, man. <laughs> but chill, dude. <laughs> this is just human beings being humans. It's the same in every aspect of life. People like to think that their tools, their things define them. My dog's better than your dog. I choose the better boots, the better car, the better golf ball. So you're an idiot and I'm superior. The internet and social media make this grandstanding one-upmanship easy because you can show off and denigrate the other guy without having to face him. It makes the accuser feel better about himself. But it's no reflection on you or the tools that you've chosen. The important thing is that we don't conflate the cartridges with their advocates or detractors. The 6.5 Creedmoor performance doesn't improve or diminish just because a braggart or a bore misrepresents it. And the 35 Remington doesn't bounce off deer at 150 yards just, beco <laughs> just because Rufus Loudmouth condemned it. <laughs> It's natural to feel offended by these characters, but it's best to ignore them and to assess cartridge bullet rifle on their actual performance. Drop, deflection, retained energy, accuracy, terminal performance, and all the rest. So cheers, my friend, and lighten up. <laughs> I appreciate that, Mark. That was a fun little exchange. Now, here is a, another patron, Caleb. He says, hey, Ron, uh, first, I want to thank you for the wonderful information and entertainment you give to hunters, sharpshooters, and conservationists alike. 
patron is new to me, so um, I may be asking this in the wrong place. Apologies if so, but I have a question about acquiring a rifle that is kind of a novelty piece for me. I want a falling block rifle, but I, I don't know how or where to find one. Is scouring the internet and every gun store in the state my best option? I'm open to any suggestions on calibers, but versatility is key for me. I, I intend to use it for pigs, deer, and coyotes. I don't mind if there's fur damage to the song dogs, and I don't have the, the need to take any shots over, oh, say, 250 to 300 yards. So what do you suggest, and how do I find it when I know what I finally want? Thanks, and God bless, Ron. Well, thank you, Caleb. And here's what I wrote back. I said, hey, Caleb, thanks heartily for your support. For falling blocks, you have several options. There's the Winchester Model 1885, the Ruger Number 1, the Park West Arms SD20, and the Uberti 1885 Courtney Stocking Rifle. Now, currently, Park West, formerly Dakota Arms, offers the most caliber options in that SD20. That used to be the Dakota 10. Same rifle, now made by Park West. I have one in 25-06 Remington, and I'm waiting for another one that's now being built for a 757 Mauser. I'm really looking forward to that one. I suggest that you Google the others and study them and their options. Ruger has been building that number one in the most chamberings over the years, but lately they've been quite limited. This year, they're offering a 6.5 Creedmoor, a 275 Rigby slash 757 Mauser, and a 257 Weatherby Magnum. But they're only available through Ellipses Distributor. Ellipses is a distributor, and they partner with Ruger. They say, build us this Ruger in this style, uh, in this chambering, and then they distribute those. So you'll have to ask your retailer, your gun dealer, if you can't get a hold of one of those. But that's what's available this year. Of course, you can always go to the used market, as you suggested, and look for all of those. Plus, well, if you really want to get fancy, you can go clear on back to the original Far Carsons from the 19th century. <laughs> I bet you they cost a pretty penny these days. Now, as far as how to chamber it for what you're shooting, this is what I wrote. Caleb, I think that you'll do well with any of the 24 calibers or the 757. The 257 Weatherby you mentioned is a smoker, and I love it, but it's a bit too fast for some hunters. Ammo is expensive too, unless you hand load. I think that a Park West and 270 Winchester would be quite versatile, if a bit much for coyotes. Uh, a 6mm Creedmoor or a 243 Winchester would be a lighter option and ideal for coyotes. Uh, enough options are, are out there to drive a guy batty. I know that. Obviously, I decided on the 25-06 for my Dakota 10 long ago, based pretty much on your criteria. The Ruger is likely to be found at the best price, so you're going to have some happy hunting for all of those, but good luck on whatever you choose. Any of those cartridges you suggested are going to work. Now, this is from uh, a non-patron, Kev. Not sure where I pulled this off of. Must have been off of uh, one of the comments on the videos. He's talking about paradigm shift and twist rate. One uh, in three twist is unheard of, and there's a secret weapon in that. The one three twist rate retains more energy. We no longer have to rely solely on grain weight and velocity. I wrote back and said, Kev, I think you might have gotten some inaccurate information there, or at least incomplete. A faster twist rate can't make a bullet retain more energy to an appreciable degree. Bullet mass and velocity determine its kinetic energy. So, mass and velocity at the time of impact determine the energy delivered to the target. A given dose of powder will create a given quantity of pressure, which can be absorbed by the projectile as two velocities, lateral and rotational. The faster the rifling twist, the faster the spin, but the slower the downrange velocity. If you want to get nitpicky, note that air drag slows downrange velocity more quickly than it does spin velocity. So technically at extended ranges, a faster spinning bullet should have a tiny bit more retained energy. Whether that can be converted into effective work is the question. Temporary wound channel in elastic tissues like lungs and muscles is much less traumatic and much less permanent than primary wound channel disruption, such as physical ripping from the projectile's contact with the tissues. So, unless a faster spinning bullet expands more or flies apart to spin shrapnel to tear vital organs, increased killing effect is, I think, questionable.
However, as more and more 1 in 3 twist rate 8.6 blackout cartridges take more game, a clearer picture of high spin effect should emerge. I suspect with a pedal style expansion, sort of like the Barnes X bullets do, and a cutting edge and a hammer, that might be proven to be correct but I don't think it's going to make a big difference. So if any of you have a lot of experience with hyper fast twist barrels, I think what Kev has seen here, what's informing him some of these videos of clear ballistic gel blocks being hit by that extremely fast twist bullet really show the twisting as it moves through that gel. And then you see all that warping in the, in the gel block bounces on the table and all that. And it looked pretty traumatic. The question is, what's that actually going to do to living tissue? when you're hunting an animal? And that's my question. All right, here are some questions that uh, Betsy got for me. Uh, here's one from John. Uh, oh, John quit drinking. It says, I quit drinking recently. <laughs> and I've decided to get into long distance shooting, put my money into something more productive. <laughs> well, that sounds great, John. Congratulations. I have hunted my whole life off and on, and I recently found your channel, and I've been learning so much from you. You inspired me to start a notebook on long distance target shooting. Can't thank you enough for the work you put into your information. I'm waiting to pick up my SIG cross rifle any day now. Wishing you good health and happiness. Well, thanks, John. I'm wishing you the same and congrats on drying out and good luck with that cross rifle. Sounds to me like you're going to have some fun with it. Here's Norma. Hi, I love your show. I've learned a bunch. I have a question. I have a 30 out 6 and I use 220 grain bullets on moose every fall. Is that overkill? <laughs> Would I have the same effect with less drop with a lighter bullet? Sincerely, Billy. Oh, it's not Norma. It's Billy. The name on the site was uh, Norma, but it's really Billy. Well, Billy, you know, you've been shooting the moose here, so I I don't think there's such a thing as overkill on a moose with a 30 out six with any bullet. All that 220 grain bullet is going to do from you is, as you've already noted, uh, reduce your long range reach because of the drop, the increased drop of the bullet. What it does in your favor for taking moose is that it has more sectional density. That means there's going to be more weight retained in the shank of the bullet, pushing the nose forward once it expands. And if you lose a lot of lead in the nose, which quite often, if not always happens with lead core bullets, you're still going to have sufficient weight in the shank in one piece to continue driving deep. So essentially, it's just penetration. You're going to get better penetration on a big animal like a moose. Now, broadside moose, boy, you can pretty much do the job with light bullets. I've often said that I've taken, I think, six or seven bull moose over the years with a variety of rifles and cartridges and bullets. The lightest I ever did it with was a 120 grain all copper bullet from a 6.5-06, which is obviously a 26 caliber. So pretty light and, and that one shot kill on that moose, but I hit it in the heart. Broadside shot, put it behind the shoulder, classic stuff. Moose, I found, are they go down just as easily as a whitetail with a shot like that. So it's not so much that you need that big heavy bullet, but it's not overkill. I mean, you're looking at an 800 to 11, 1200 pound animal on a big bull moose. So a little old 220 grade bullet sounds pretty big when you're shooting a 30 out six <laughs> compared to the size of that moose. It's not much, but you're also right in suspecting that a lighter bullet would give you more reach. I have found that 180 grain bullets from uh, 30 out six do just fine taking down moose. And if you want to have a, a little flatter trajectory, I think you go with a 180 grain spire point of good construction, something like a, a nozzle partition, any of the bonded bullets or the all copper bullets, uh, you're going to do just fine. All right, here is Jay. The thing with the hydrostatic shock theory, it has been disproven by the research. Oh, this should be interesting. I asked about that when we last talked about the uh, famous hydrostatic shock, which many pointed out should be hydrodynamic shock. And I have stated as much before. Covey, what is going on with you down there? Betsy's going down to see if she can settle down Covey. She's taken on an interesting behavior of late. Every time we do these broadcasts up here, she starts to whine and bark. I think she wants to be part of the program. <laughs> she hears us talking and wonders what all the excitement is about, and she's not included. Bad move. Um, back to the hydrostatic shock theory from Jay. The shock wave absolutely works, just not the way people think it does. 
the elasticity of the flesh can be exceeded with velocity, and it will cause exsanguination. Ooh, there's that word again. We got that last time. It means bleeding uh, at a rapid pace. From FBI testing with shooting animals at slaughterhouses and data collected from police and military firefights, they have concluded the impact velocity must be in excess of 1,800 feet per second to have this hydro hydrodynamic effect. It's no guarantee to drop an animal where it stands, but the faster rate of blood loss due to the surrounding tissue damage is always a good thing. That's kind of been my observations too, Jay. Now, I see here we've got Mark. There's a couple more on this topic, so let's just jump into those. Here's Jason. You've seen hydrostatic shock at work. Example. When a bottle of water explodes when you shoot it, when a watermelon is shot and it explodes, when you shoot ballistic gel, and not only does the wound cavity expand three to ten times the diameter of the bullet, but you'll also see the ballistic gel block wiggle. That wiggle is the hydrostatic shock wave moving through the ballistic gelatin. While this shock wave may or may not interfere with the nervous system, it can and usually does stop things like breathing and heartbeat, <laughs> causing the animal to drop in its tracks. It's also the reason you see animals that appear dead jump up and start running off. Yes, and I've seen all that too, Jason. Um, and that's why I don't think anyone can really depend on hydrostatic shock. I'll have folks comment and say the most important thing that a bullet can do is deliver hydrostatic shock because it kills instantly perfectly all the time. And that's just not the case. And I've tried figuring this out over the years. You know, some say, well, if you hit them in the heart, that's when it's going to happen. Or you just have to hit the certain spot where the nerve bundle is and it's going to happen. And I don't know, I've just put so many bullets in in these places and rarely it'll happen. You know, just one shot and that deer is, or elk are just dead instantly. But most of the time it's blood loss. They'll take off for anywhere from three seconds to maybe 10 seconds. And then they, I always say, run out of gas. And it's mostly what we're talking about is blood pressure in the brain. When you get dizzy and you faint from low blood pressure, that's what happens when you get massive hemorrhaging in the chest cavity. So the animal runs, the brain's still functioning, but then once that pressure drops, ooh, they get dizzy and they fall over. So I think that's what's going on most of the time. But then there are those smacks that are so dramatic, you just go, wow, hydrostatic shock. Did you see that thing go down? And then, well, let's see if there are any more. I'm going to throw something out if I don't see any more things here on hydrostatic shock. And I don't. So I want to say this. The best research that I have read about this involved that veterinarian culling operation somewhere in Africa. They were taking Cape Buffalo out and they made careful notes on how the buffalo react, reacted to the shot. And then they autopsied them to see what the damage was. And the ones that seemed to have died instantly from hydrostatic shock that were not struck in the central nervous system, the spine or the brain, but then died anywhere very quickly, they determined that the uh, blood vessels in the brain had erupted, and that must have been from pressure. So think about pressure in the blood system. When your heart beats, I think it's a systolic beat. Nope, my wife is shaking her head. No, it is systolic. Yeah. It's the systolic. I was right. The systolic pressure of the heart pumping, that's when it's at its maximum pressure. If the bullet happens to strike right, probably right in the heart or close to it at that very time, that increases the pressure. So you're adding bullet pressure to blood pressure, and that's enough to give it an aneurysm. You just blow out. And that seemed to just balance right, right with what they were seeing on those reactions from those buffalo. And several folks have written in from time to time mentioning that study and or one like it. And I think that's the best explanation for this. The other good one, though, is that nerve bundle. And I always want to say solar plexus, but that's a bundle of nerves down near the stomach. There's another one, the brachial plexus, that's up higher in the chest or on an animal would be above the shoulder. That might be some of what's going on with that high shoulder shot. Although I have found that most of the time when I make that dramatic high shoulder shot and it's instant down, I have struck or struck awfully close to the uh, spinal column. And that, of course, in front of the withers, up into the neck and the head, those spine shots are known to take the animal out right now. If you hit the spine, but if you're just close to it and don't 
and literally break that spinal column, I've had them get up and run off several times. So I don't advocate for the next shot. But at the same time, you're close enough to the top of the lungs that you usually damage them and you get the hemorrhaging. So something like that's going on, guys. And I always appreciate everyone weighing in on this. Sometimes it takes a whole bunch of observations from a lot of people to get all this stuff figured out. But I think my overall advice is don't depend on hydrostatic shock or hydrodynamic shock to do the job for you. Always go for that heart shot, lung shot, chest shot. That's going to definitely hemorrhage enough to get your animal. Uh, a lot of folks do like to try for the central nervous system shots. And it certainly works and works perfectly when you make the shot. But it's always a smaller target. And there's always a chance that that target can move. Yeah, especially the neck and the head, because that's the first thing when a deer's alerted or suddenly decides to move, his chest probably isn't going anywhere before his head does. All right. Now, here's somebody called Philip. So the safety warning in capital letters, do not use anyone's 257 Roberts ammunition loading in a SMLE rifle. That's the short magazine Lee Enfield rifle from World War I and even before there. Um, chambered in 303-25. Oh, this is someone had written in from Australia that they, they necked down to 303 British cartridge to 25 caliber. It's pretty popular over there. Um, this guy says, don't use uh, the loading data from a 257 Roberts in this Wildcat 303-25 in a SMLE or smile, people call those rifle. I am from Southern um, NSW. Northwest Territories. I'm not sure where that is in Australia, guys. You're going to have to invite me over there and show me. <laughs> I grew up in a family where using the 303-22. Wow, that's a hot one. And the 303-25 was normal. Our actions included the SMLE P14 and P17s. My favorite chambering is the 257 Roberts. And I would never use any of my Roberts load data in a 303-25. He's meaning the powder, the primer, and the bullet, not interchanging the cases of these cartridges. But he says, if you use the Roberts data in that 30325, it's potentially dangerous. Uh, the Roberts loadings are typically two grains more powder than he would use in a 30325 in his rifle actions. And those older actions are probably a little more fragile than some of the newer stuff and probably can't take the pressures. Okay, so good advice there, Philip. Appreciate that for all of you 30325 shooters out there. <laughs> Can't imagine there are that many, but then we're not in Australia here. We're, we're in Idaho. Joseph, imagine yourself sitting around a fire eating buffalo that you've just killed with a sharp rock tied to a stick shot from a longer stick with a gut string. <laughs> While you chew on a hunk of roasted meat, you listen to a group of modern hunters arguing about all these modern hunting bullets. That's a good one, Joseph. Again, a good point. Of course, cavemen were killing giant bison long before any bullets came along, other than the rocks that they tied to the end of their arrows or spears. And we make all this fuss about, oh my gosh, do I need one of these or will this one do the job? <laughs> yeah, we've got more than enough horsepower, folks. You just have to put it in the right place and then you can get around a campfire and argue about whose uh, stone point is better than the next, guys. Jason, I think you're missing one more development in rifle cartridges. Oh, this is in reference to a recent um, video we did on the evolution of, or the history of the development of the all-metallic rifle cartridge, starting from the, the very first one, the 22 short in 1857 by Smith & Wesson, right on up to the current, 7 PRC, 300 PRC, all these new modern things. I sort of went through all the major stages of that. So Jason says, I'm missing one development. And that would be the steel base with the SIG Fury. Ah, the 277 SIG Fury cartridge. It increases pressures to 80,000 PSI. How well it pans out with barrel wear is, barrel wear is something else, but good information, Ron. I heard that flow bear rifles, but I didn't know that that was the start of brass cartridges. Yes, the flow bear was a Frenchman named flow bear who took a muzzleloader cap and put a BB on top of it and made a little gun to shoot it. 
So there was no powder in it. It was just a priming mix in that little muzzleloader cap. They used it for a little target gun for shooting indoors for fun and games kind of a thing. But that was a nascent idea that came to fruition. Uh, and then Smith & Wesson just lengthened the, the brass on that a little bit, put some powder in it to make the 22 short, and it progressed upward from there. And that was the start of it. But yeah, the uh, 277 Sig Fury is that new cartridge that the military is uh, has adopted. They have accepted it as a rifle cartridge that they are going to use. It's not going to replace completely the the M4s and the 5.56 NATO cartridge, but it will be another one in the mix. I suspect they're thinking of replacing all the anything that was shooting the 308 cartridges, but find out all about that but it is going to be available and we've got a video coming up here real soon i was able to interview someone from sig about the development of the 277 civilian version of that cartridge and rifle and he had some encouraging news to put out on that one so stay tuned for that here is a uh, another jason i don't know if it's the same one let's see oh he's it might be the same, Jason, because he's also talking about the uh, development of cartridges. You skipped over two very important steps in the evolution of the modern cartridge. The 308 Winchester was a competitor to the 300 Savage, which was a two Savage necked up. Charles Newton, the developer of the 250 Savage, created the first round to ever break the 3,000 foot per second barrier. That is a fairly common knowledge, but he also developed a 30 Newton, which used a larger case head and would have been much more popular if modern propellants we use today had been available back then. The 30 Newton, shortened and fed with better powders, is essentially now the 300 WSM. When it comes to bridging the gap between the evolution of bottleneck cartridges and truly fast cartridges, nobody played a more pivotal role than Mr. Newton. You also forgot the best WSM cartridge of all, the 325. You get 8mm Remington mag performance from a short-action rifle. Whoo, boy, that's a lot to digest there, Jason. But um, a couple of clarifications here. Yes, Charles Newton developed a 250 Savage. It was called originally the 250-3000 Savage because it did, just as you say, broke that 3,000 feet per second barrier using an 87-grain bullet, which I understand Mr. Newton wasn't real crazy about because he thought it should be shooting a 100-grain bullet which they did offer, but they went down to the 87 just so they could say 3,000 feet per second, we've got the record. <laughs> kind of cute, but um, I don't, you know, it makes sense to say that he then developed the 300 Savage because the 250, I think, came out in 20, 1915. It was about five years later, so probably around 1920, the 300 Savage came out, which kind of surprised me. I would have thought, 300 Savage, then you neck it down, you use your 25, but he went the other way. But he started the development with the 30 out 6 case. He just shortened that down. You look at the base and head diameters, it's 30 out 6. So he shortened things down and made that 250, and then he decided to open it up and make the 300. But most of the time, they credit the 30 out 6 as being the parent of both of those. But who knows? Could have gone either way. Um, but then there was one other thing. Oh, that 30 Newton, you know, that is an unusual one because you're right. It uh, essentially had the same diameter of case without a belt as the current fat shorts have, like the WSMs. I don't think he based it off the 404 Jeffrey, but it was awfully close. It was over five inches in diameter on the body of that thing. But I don't think it was quite as wide as the 404 Jeffrey. And that's about a 0.54 inch diameter. So it's getting right up there. But why it didn't stay popular, I'm not real sure. Maybe you're right. Maybe it was that the powders just weren't developed well enough to take advantage of all that. But Winchester did offer the 30 Newton as a factory round for quite a while, well into the 20s, maybe up even into the 30s. So it was around for a while, and it was a, the length of a 30 out 6 So one of the, the early fat ones over here. Here is someone from Paraguay, Arturo. Hello there, I'm from Paraguay, South America, and I own a 4082 Winchester, and I only have 16 rounds left. <laughs> I would really like to get some reload data and info about brass primers and bullet molds. Thanks. Boy, yeah, you could use that stuff if you've only got 16 left. Save that brass. 
Um, gosh, I don't know exactly, Arturo, where you can go. You're going to have to just start doing some searching online because there are some brass manufacturers I'm certain will have this. Most of those old black powder cartridges can be had or found from places like Starline Brass. So just look for brass manufacturers and oddball numbers and stuff like that. Anyone here who can help Arturo out, uh, write in and let us know and we'll get that information out the next time. But that stuff can all be made and probably is being made and available right now. This is someone named Cruelton. It sounds like it might be kind of cruel here. Let's see. A critical review. It's getting worse. <laughs> First, you both are appealing to sales fake promotional dialect. What? What? Oh, I think... He is referring to the 22 Creedmoor video we did. Joseph Von Benedict and I got together and compared some rifles and talked all about the 22 Creedmoor. I think this is what Cruelton is referring to. He says, first, you both are appealing to a sales-like slash fake promotional dialect. I don't, don't know that I was using any dialects. Sometimes I'll use the Swedish dialect or somebody from Minnesota. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't think I was doing it in that, uh, and I don't think Joseph was either because he sounded like he always sounds like to me. Secondly, for those who continue to listen and give you a chance, well, I, I hope some folks do, quick tip, please explicitly make the distinction between the rounds you throw up as if it was very unclear which one was which, since you didn't specify each one in view, and I didn't know which was which. Thanks for your video. Well, after all that, he likes the video after all. I'm sorry, Cruelton. Well, we weren't putting up fake accents and dialects. I'm sorry. We just, that's the way we talk, I guess. But yeah, it probably would have been smart to put some uh, names up there on the close-ups of the cartridges. Um, but for any of you who want to look at that, again, the red tip bullet is the uh, Creedmoor cartridge and the no tip bullet it's actually, what did I load on? It was a 22-250 Ackley Improved. It looks almost exactly the same size, a little bit longer than the uh, Creedmoor. That one does not have a colored tip on it because it's a burger bullet. Yeah. So that one's just all copper bullet, real long. It's sleek and needle pointed. That's the 250 AI, Ackley Improved. And then the short one with the severely tapered walls, I figured everybody would recognize that as the 22250 Remington, the original. And that one had a green tip on it. So red tip, cream more, no tip. Um, burger on the 22250 Ackley Improved. And the green tip is a Sierra bullet on top of a 22250 Remington. Whew. Sorry we didn't label those for you. Well, he didn't rip me as dad badly as I thought he was going to when he started. This is Barbara. I love the episode. Uh, not sure which one yet, but thanks anyway. Other than a couple of mistakes, actually misspoken, it was awesome. Oh, I'm liking this now, Barbara. I love that bell. That is the coolest thing I've seen in a long time. Where did you get it? On the subject of older cartridges, I was talking with a guy at our local gun range, and he was lamenting that the 30 out 6 and he was wondering if it was worth buying one. Someone had offered him a great deal on one. I told him the truth. The only problem with the 30 out 6 and any other older rifle is not the cartridge, but the barrel twist rate. I told him to buy the rifle and have it rebarreled with a faster twist barrel. Then he could say that he has a 30 out 6 and have a rifle that can take advantage of modern bullets. Let's face it. That is really the only difference between old and new cartridges. The older cartridges are only limited by the slower twist rate of the barrel that they were designed for. I don't understand why people throw away their old rifles. Have it rebarreled. Use modern bullets. Done. Well, that's some good advice, Barbara, except you don't have to rebarrel a 30 out 6 to a faster twist. It already has a 1 in 10 twist, and that's considered kind of standard for all the 30s, including the big magnums. So a 30 out 6 can easily handle a 200 grain long sleek high BC bullet, 210 grain. They can hunt. I know they'll stabilize 220 grain round nose bullets, but I've heard from quite a few people who say their standard one in 10 inch twist 30 out 6 rifles will handle a 200 grain uh, high BC bullet. It's the length of the bullet that makes you require a faster twist to stabilize it, not just the weight. It's the length. Um, so yeah, you can try them out, but boy, in most cases, you are maximizing performance out of a 30 out six with a one in 10 twist barrel, no problem. But you are correct in that some older rifles, um, with the slower twist barrels, 
do not permit the use of the latest and greatest high BC bullets. But as many point out, there's really not a need for it either for hunting. If you want to do long range target shooting, definitely the high BC bullets give you a huge advantage because they just make it so much easier to keep your bullets on the target, regardless of the wind speed and direction. If you don't figure out the wind speed perfectly, those bullets are going to compensate because they resist drag better than the blunter bullets. So there's your advantage. But anybody who has an old rifle, an old action, and you want to switch barrels, you want a different cartridge or a twist rate or whatever, yes, you can just switch the barrel. You don't have to throw the stock and the action away. <laughs> it's all still good. It is, we always say it's like putting new tires on your truck. So nice one. I'm glad you say it. Now, wait a minute. You said something about a bell. Yeah, you started off about the bell. We will talk more about the bell and show one of them toward the end of this show. So hang in there. We are going to be ringing the bell and telling you all about the Second Amendment freedom bells. Braxton, Ron, how dare you kill an animal in the wild? Uh-oh, here we go, guys. How dare you kill an animal in the wild? Why can't you go to the grocery store where there's no animal harmed? <laughs> Oh, he's joking. He says lots of laughs. Don't those people just get on your nerves? My question is, what is it uh, that one gun that you absolutely are in love with? Which rifle do you possibly love more than your wife? <laughs> lots of laughs. Yeah, you better laugh, Braxton. But Betsy hears this. She's going to pound me. I do not love any rifles more than my wife. Sorry, guys. <laughs> That's a no-brainer. Come on. Who would pick a rifle over his spouse? Well, don't answer that. Some of you folks maybe don't have that happy of a spouse. I don't know. <laughs> no, you know what? I don't even have an absolute favorite rifle. Um, gosh, I like so many of them. They're so enjoyable. I don't know. It's like, I guess it's like any other tool in your life. Uh, there are just some tools that feel right in your hand. You know, just a certain hammer or certain pliers works better than the next one or something. But uh, I, I, I enjoy a lot of them, but I do like my rifle slim and trim and uh, pretty light uh, for easy handling. And of course, accuracy is always job number one. But boy, you give me a 12 pound bench rest rifle that send me out in the woods for an elk hunt. I'm not going to be too happy. <laughs> All right, Sammy. Sammy says that he was a subscriber to Outdoor Life, Sports of Field and Field and Stream magazines for many years. So was I, Sammy. I still have many of those old magazines, and I cannot bear to throw them away. When one arrived, the shooting articles were the first place I went. That and Pat McManus's stories. Gosh, she was funny. I learned so much from Jack O'Connor, Jim Carmichael, and some writer named Spomer. <laughs> thanks, Ron, for all you taught me, and I'm still learning from you. Oh, thanks, Sammy. That's sweet. I'll tell you what, I learned a lot more from Jack O'Connor and Jim Carmichael than I ever did from some guy named Spomer, but I appreciate the support. All right, guys, this is fun. Let's see what the team pulled up here for us for the big surprises. Before we get to the bell ringing, Michael from Wisconsin. How does a 6.5 PRC shooting 143 grain ELDX bullet compared to a 300 wind mag shooting 178 grain ELDX bullet at 300 yards and beyond? Oh, my goodness. Any information would be greatly appreciated. Thank you. Well, Michael, that's a little bit too much information for me to pull out by the old hard drive here. But let me think for a second. A 6.5 PRC is going to spit that 143 grain bullet around. Ooh, I'm going to say 2,900 feet per second. Depending on your barrel length, you might get 3,000. And 143 ELDX, I think it's a 0.625 BC on that bullet. The 300 Win Mag 178 grain bullet uh, ELDX, that's got to be close to six. We're going to say more like 0.58. So you're going to have an advantage in ballistics efficiency out of the a lighter bullet. You're going to immediately get more energy out of the heavier bullet because the wind mag should throw that that bullet around 3,000 to 3,100 feet per second. So figure roughly 100 feet per second, more velocity out of the 300, but better efficiency out of the lighter bullet from the 6.5. So at 300 yards, I think your 300 wind mag is still going to be carrying more energy. Your drops and drifts are going to be about the same I think you're going to have to get out there closer to 600 yards before you see the 6.5 PRC start to take over, dropping a little bit less, drifting a little bit less in the wind. 
just because of its higher BC. But the 300 wind mags energy levels should stay above it well beyond that. So uh, if you want exact numbers, you're going to have to run some ballistic calculators because, boy, there's so <laughs> many numbers in there <laughs> for every yardage distance. But that's roughly my idea of what's going to be happening there. So. All right. Oh, Gregory, what's this? Enjoy the channel. Thank you, Gregory from Ontario. He's asking about African hunting books. Just wanted to show you. Uh, there's a lot of African hunting related books that you've mentioned. And Oh, he's got a picture of them. I can't show you guys this picture. He has a photograph of one, two, three, four, five, ah, six. He's got about 30 books all laid out. African hunter and all kinds of African hunting books, jungles, safaris, the mammals of Africa. Yeah, guys, there are all sorts of great books out there on Africa. I've got a fair collection myself. I never thought of spreading them all out, well, out like that, taking a picture to show you guys. But just do some basic research on Africa books, hunting, big game animals, and you can find anything and everything. Tales of of a buffalo goring people and, and lions tearing them up and hunting them successfully and all that. There's the old classics as well as some new stuff. And I love the old classics because you go back ooh, around 1800s and even earlier than that. And then it's by the late 19th century and early 20th century. That was kind of the heyday of African exploration when they really started to penetrate to the interior. And you had folks like Caramojo Bell doing commercial ivory hunting and stuff. Those are some pretty fascinating times. You want to read about that. So, yeah, by the way, we're we're doing some Africa hunts this year. I'm looking forward to that. It's just always a great treat to grow to go over there. If any of you are interested in hunting Africa, uh, drop me a line. Go to ronspomeroutdoors.com, my website, and go to the comment section and send me a little note there. We might have room on a couple of our hunts yet for this year. You might be able to squeeze in really quickly if you're interested. You can come along. Here's uh, Charles from California. Have you done a program on the various reticles available in scopes and the pros and cons of some of them? If not, please do. Yeah, Charles, uh, I've touched on it a few times, but I haven't really done an exhaustive one because they are, well, they're rather difficult to photograph looking through the scope and get it nice and sharp. It can be done, but it's a bit of a hassle. I've tried it and I've succeeded to some degree. A guy can always steal some images off of different websites where they show their reticles and explain them. But I think the bigger issue is there are so many in so many formats that I don't know that a guy could get it done without a major expedition because you've got all sorts of different hash lines and marks. Some of our some of them are minute of angle marks. Some of them are mill radians, and those are two completely different systems. And then some of them are just simple. This line represents 300 yards. The next line represents 400 with a certain bullet at a certain velocity of a certain ballistics coefficient. It gets pretty complicated. So, yeah, maybe I will try to do uh, something like that, an abbreviated version of it. But, boy, folks, if you are interested in the different reticles and what they are good for. You're just going to have to get dive into this stuff and get online and see what you can come up with because it gets pretty complicated until you sort it out and then start focusing in on one. The biggest choice you probably have to make initially is whether you want the first focal plane or the second. So the difference is on a scope, you turn up your power, you magnify the power. That happens um, toward the front. So if you have a reticle in front of that, that is going to just in size along with the target. So let's say you're at 2x and you've got a deer out there and you want to crank it up to 10x. As you dial up the power, the deer gets bigger and so do the reticle lines and the spaces between those lines. So they stay in the same relationship with the animal size. They don't suddenly get bigger than the animal and then block him out. Um, or when you get smaller, they would block him out. So you can use all those lines and numbers for, say, if it's a 300-yard line, it stays at that, whatever the setting on the power is. The second focal plane is behind that adjustment. So when you turn your power up, the target gets bigger, but the reticle stays the same size. And then when you dial it down, you've got a potentially a fat reticle covering up a lot of your target. That's why they went to those duplex-style reticles. Fat on the edges so you can 
get your eye focused toward the middle. And then they taper down to real thin so they don't obscure the target at a low power. But the problem with those is if you have multiple reticles in there and you want to select the right one for 300 or 400 yards, suddenly they change in relationship to the size of the animal when you're dialing your power up. So you generally can only use those at top magnification. Unless you really understand the relationships, then you can dial them down to half power and cut things in half and whatnot and figure it out. But it gets pretty complicated and confusing. And that's why I'm, I'm not going to be doing it here. So I do a lot of research on that stuff and come up with it. I think most hunters, it seems these days, are going with the turret dialing scopes instead of the reticle variations. Um, the reticle choices can be really quick if you practice a lot with it. Fully understand it and then train and train and train so that you don't have to scratch your head and look at all those lines and get confused. And I do like the... Um, lines on the horizontal reticle for wind deflection. It's nice to know you've got an MOA line, one, two, three, four, five, and then you know your minute of angle adjustment needed for a certain wind speed. You can pick those lines and move it over. Uh, similar thing, obviously, with vertical for your drops. But again, you get so many lines sometimes that you just get confused unless you use those over and over. It's like riding a bicycle with your eyes closed and your hands tied behind your back. <laughs> you got to know what you're doing. But uh, practice will get you there. Sorry, I couldn't have been a little quicker, simpler, faster, easier on all that stuff, Charles, but it kind of complicated. Don in Arkansas has got something to ask me about cartridges, the way it looks. Please tell me where the 264 Win Mag ranks in the 6.5 category against other 6.5 rounds, like the Creedmoor and others. I watch all of your shows as much as possible. I love what you do, and I thank you for keeping us in the know. Well, thank you, Don. The 264 Win Mag is toward the upper third of the of the heap. Your 6.5 Creedmoor is kind of in the bottom third. 6.5 PRC is kind of in the middle, uh, along with the 6.5 uh, RPM from Weatherby and the 6.5 Remington Magnum, the old one from back in the 60s. Uh, so you're looking at, well, let's see, there's even slower ones like the um, 6.5. Do they have a 6.5 ARC or is it only the, yeah, 6 millimeter ARC? Oh, Grendel. I'm thinking of the 6.5 Grendel. That's the short one, the short light one. So, yeah, you work your way up. Grendel, Creedmoor, PRC, 6.5 RPM, 264 Win Mag would pop up right after the 6.5 PRC and at, at RPM, I believe. And then faster would be the 6.5-300 Weatherby Magnum and the 26 Nosler. Those are the screamers at the top of the heap. So yeah, put the 264 at the bottom of the top third <laughs> or at the top of the middle third, somewhere in there. All right, Dean, Mossany, Mos Wisconsin. Mossany, Wisconsin. I've never heard of that one before. Did a little bit of work in Wisconsin, but must not have tumbled onto this town. Dean says, what ways to tame recoil on a 7 millimeter Remington Ultra Magnum in a Remington Model 700 with a 36-inch barrel? You must mean 26-inch, Dean, unless you rebarreled it with a monster barrel three feet long. I think you meant 26-inch. That's kind of the standard. So we're going to go with that. How do you tame the recoil? Oh, uh, Typical ways are to put a muzzle brake on it and blow your ears out. Really does tame the recoil well. But man, are you going to blow your ears out. So make sure you have good hearing protection on. The other way is with a suppressor. That one I like because it tames the blast down at the same time it tames the recoil down. Sweet. Still going to be pretty loud with that much powder going off and popping out of there. Um, you might want to still use some earplugs on that one. Uh, and then the other way is obviously with a softer recoil pad. If you want to go that route, that'll help a fair amount. And the comb, sometimes a lot of guys will get kicked up in a, against the bone of your cheek with the recoil. If that's bothering you, you could get some sort of a comb cover of rubberized thing. Some of the modern stocks now come with inserts that are foam sort of compressible, and those really help. But you can get aftermarket things that you kind of strap over the top, and they will do the same thing. Um, and then, of course, you can always wear a pad, a past recoil pad, P-A-S-T, past recoil pad to absorb some. And then you can add more weight to the rifle. 
Some guys will add weight to the buttstock, and one of those options is just a, a mercury tube reducer. I don't know if they actually do mercury anymore since it's toxic, uh, but tungsten is used. So they get a little tube and they put tungsten in it, and then that shifts back and forth and absorbs some of that recoil. Work pretty well. We've tried them in some 458 lots, and my wife was using it in a 375 H&H. Really helped tame things down. And then you could also put weight up in the fore end if you want to take your stock off, drill some holes up in the channel and put some lead in. Guys will try that. So a number of ways to do it. But uh, yeah, you're paying the price for having all that power in your seven millimeter. When you go up to a rum or a 28 nozzle, you get a little more bite than you do from a seven rim mag. Now, Andre in Quebec. Ron, can you tell me what hat you are wearing? How did you know I was wearing a hat? I, this hasn't even aired yet. <laughs> what hat you are wearing and where to find it, please? Many thanks. Well, this is an Outback Trading Company hat. What is it called? I've forgotten. But it's on my website. Go to ronspomeroutdoors.com. Go to the store. There's the hat. You can purchase it there. Interesting thing about this Outback Trading Company. I was loving this hat design, and I thought, man, they might give me uh, a hat that I can sell on my on website and it, drive people over there and give me a little cut in the action, you know, like 10% of every sale or something. Woo thought I was going to get rich. So I contacted them and said, yeah, I'm getting quite a bit of interest on this hat that I wear. Thought you might want to sort of sponsor me as being the official hat of Ron Spomer. Ah, nah, you're not that big of a star. We don't think we need you. <laughs> Okay, I couldn't understand that. <laughs> well, what do you know? About six months later, somebody says, hey, I see they're advertising their Ron Spomer hat on outdoor training. What? We looked it up, and sure enough, they had a little blurb on there saying the hat that Ron Spomer wears, and there it was. <laughs> so I was just famous enough to mention on there without my 10% cut. <laughs> but hey, go to ronspomeroutdoors.com, and you'll find the hat there. You can click on it and buy it. I forgot what it cost, 50, 60 bucks or something. But I've had this thing for, gosh, about 13 years now, and it's still hanging in there. So more power to it. All right, who's next? Uh, Rafe from California. Greetings, I'm writing to ask you two questions. The first being, how do you take care of your hat? Oh, boy, it's a hat time. <laughs> I just purchased the same one for fishing and it works great, but I know it needs to be oiled every so often. Would you please tell me about how you take care of it? The second question is about fishing. I'd like to take a bet that you at least try to fly fish now and then, right? Regardless, if you read this or not, thanks for the great content. May your channel continue to grow a larger audience. Well, appreciate that, Rafe. And yes, you are right. I love to fly fish. I don't get anywhere close to enough chances to do it or make enough chances to do it. We're so busy here with the ranch and the gardens and the habitat improvement programs and stuff in the summer. Just can't seem to shake it. And then, of course, doing all these videos and writing a few magazine articles and whatnot, it just takes up so much time. And I keep telling my wife, dear wife, we've got to quit working so hard and go fishing because <laughs> she loves to fish, too. And it's not like we're living in the desert. You know, we're in Idaho. We do have some trout streams around here. But, boy, I do have a potential trip set up with a, a lodge and a guide on the Snake River for this spring. He's going to call me when the action gets hot and we are going to take a day off and go catch some big trout. So I will keep you guys informed on how that action works. But yeah, I wish I could be doing more fishing. You know, actually, when we moved to the ranch, I stuffed my fly rod. Uh, I don't know. I've got about a half dozen of them. And I, the one that was my favorite, expensive, I think it's a Winston. Let's see. Yeah, this will let you know what's coming here. The Winston. What? I think it was the Winston because I got it where it is. <laughs> we moved to the place and I thought, I got to put this somewhere where it will be safe. And I thought that I stuck it up in one of those closet shelves so it wouldn't get bumped and damaged or any kind where we're moving furniture and everything. And then when it came time to go fishing and I wanted to find it, I couldn't find it. I looked up on all these shelves. I thought, I thought I put it up there. Found all the other ones leaning up in a corner, but not that one. And I looked and I looked for years, six years, I looked for that. I finally found it last summer. I gave it one more try and looked up in all of those. And one closet had a box that I thought was shoved clear against the wall in the back. But it was this far away from the wall because there was that Winston rod case with that rod in it back there. Boy, was that like Christmas morning. <laughs> 
So I got my Winston back. Now I have to take it fishing. All right. Now back to your first question. Oh, the hat. I tell you what I've done to, to keep this hat ticking. Nothing. I brushed it off a few times when it got really dirty, but I did not oil it yet. And I see that it's starting to fray a little bit here on the corner. So yeah, you need to put some wax on it. Um, I don't know if that company that makes it offers a wax, but Filson's waxed garments, you know, the Filson um, waxed canvas stuff, they sell a wax that you can put on all the waxed stuff like this. And that's what you want to use. But barring that, I think you could probably just use some candle wax or something, but some kind of a boot wax would do just fine. Okay, that looks like the end of the questions. And I went on and on with all sorts of personal stuff. I apologize, guys. But I hope we all learned a little bit of something about something. And now it is time for our comment of the week. And this is Joseph. Joseph is the gentleman who wrote in and talked about sitting around the campfire, eating the buffalo that you killed with a sharp rock tied to a stick, launched by another stick with some gut string. (laughs) While you listen to modern hunters grumble about bullets and cartridges. <laughs> that was pretty cute, Joseph. We really appreciate it. There, uh, you are the winner. And the freedom bell here is what I promised I would tell you folks about is made by a sculptor friend of mine, Doug Adams. He's got an A on the back of there for Adams. And he makes these out of scrap iron. He is an old welder who turned sculpture and he uses old iron that he scraps up from old farmsteads and car parts and gun parts and whatever he can find. He tries to get all American iron or steel as he knows it so he can recycle it. And he builds these cool holders for these bells that he cuts out of tanks. And man, do they have a beautiful ring. I mean, if you strike them hard, they really put out some volume. Great way to call the folks home for dinner (laughs) or signal a wake-up time in a hunting camp. If you're looking for a little gift for somebody who has everything, I would recommend one of these. Now, Doug calls these his Second Amendment Freedom Bells, Let Freedom Ring. And he shoots the bass. Well, actually, he's having me shoot the bases of them now. This is a 30-odd six. Nice little group right there. So uh, if you're interested in an unusual gift, go to Ron Spomer Outdoors to the store and look for Doug Adams Second Amendment Freedom Bells. And you, too, can ring in freedom. Thanks, everyone. Until next time, this is Ron Spomer listening to the overtones of the Freedom Bell. Hunt honest and shoot straight.